Okay, if you're attending a job interview as a backend developer, there is almost a guarantee that you will be asked questions about microservices, all right? So you have to prepare for microservice interview questions. So in this video, I'm going to look up some top microservice interview questions and try and answer them, at the risk of embarrassing myself. Um, this is not live, so if, if it turns out bad, then I'm not gonna upload the video. So if you're seeing this, chances are that I didn't embarrass myself that much, okay? So let's tackle microservice interview questions and let's see how I do. Would I give myself a job? Let's see, microservice interview questions. All right, I'm gonna pick the, the very first link. All right, top 25 microservice interview questions and answers. Uh, let me actually do this. I'm going to open uh, DevTools so that I have some way of covering the screen. I don't wanna see the answers. Um, let me move this up here. All right, now I can gradually reveal this as I go. So I'm gonna tackle the top 25 microservice interview questions. I'm gonna provide my answers and um, let's see how I do. Okay, explain microservice architecture. Uh, a microservice architecture is a way in which you architect your microservices. There are different ways in which you can architect it. I'm guessing this question has explained what what microservices are, uh, which is which is a fair question to ask. It's a good first question to ask. Well, microservices itself is a way in which you build your application uh, by breaking them down into smaller pieces and uh, deploying them separately as separate processes, possibly on separate machines, and have them talk to each other so that they farm together, work together to farm your uh, application. This is opposed to the monolithic way of building applications where everything was deployed and built as one piece, okay? With microservices, you basically separate your application out into smaller pieces, which are kind of independent. They're self-sufficient in a way, although they need to talk to each other in order to do something valuable. Um, the key thing to remember here is that these are separate processes when deployed and when they are running, as opposed to the code base itself. It's not tied to the code base. You can have multiple separate code bases and still build a monolith, okay? And you can have a big code base and still deploy several microservices from that single code base. There's this thing called the mono repo, which basically means all your applications go into one repo. So it's not associated with code base, okay? It's associated with the form that it takes when you're deploying it. Okay, so that's microservices. Essentially, the key factors here are smaller pieces, smaller units of deployment and runtime. They run on separate processes and uh, they're fairly independent. You basically chunk them down based on kind of like the business value. You have smaller teams working on smaller problems. They tackle those smaller problems and build microservices, which, which solves those smaller problems, but they don't farm an application itself. They work with other uh, microservices to farm your application. And then the communication happens via APIs. A common choice is REST APIs and the common payload is JSON. So that's kind of like an overview of all the different important characteristics of uh, microservices. Uh, let's see, what do these guys say? Microservice architecture is an architectural development style which builds an application as a collection of small autonomous services developed for a business domain. Fair enough, fair enough. I'd be happy if somebody gave me this answer in an interview, that's fine. All right, moving on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Name three commonly used tools for microservices. Tools for microservices, not, not exactly sure what they mean by tools. Um, do they mean like libraries for doing certain stuff with microservices? So for example, service discovery uh, uses Eureka, okay? So you use Eureka as a library for doing service discovery. Is that a tool for microservices? I don't know. Um, you have Zipkin, you have uh, Hysterix, all these are libraries. I'd probably go there. Uh, I honestly don't know what these guys are talking about. Wiremark, Docker, and Hystrix are important microservices tool. Okay, so um, <laughs> Hystrix is what I was talking about. It's it's a library which allows you to do, uh, it's, it, it belongs to that class of things where you're, you're addressing cross-cutting concerns, right? Uh, Docker, yes, I give you that. It is it is used in commonly in the microservice context. Wiremark, seriously, I don't know. 
if you think about tools, probably the most commonly used tool when you're working with microservices is a REST API client, something like Postman, right? No matter what you use, you're guaranteed to use Postman or a similar tool when you're building microservices. So that would be a good answer for like, what is it, what is the tool you use? It's, it's, it's an odd question. All right, moving on. What is monolithic architecture? Uh, this is the, um, the opposite of what I was talking about with microservices, right? With monolithic architecture, what you have is your application deployed as a single unit, okay? It goes as one thing that gets deployed and then it runs as one thing. So you don't have all these smaller services which talk to each other. It's just one application, right? It's just one thing which, which executes and does its thing, all right? So that's monolithic architecture. It's a, as they say, it's a big container of, all the software components in an application clubbed inside a single package. And again, the key here is it's not about the code base, okay? It's about what gets deployed, what gets built and what gets deployed. If it's built and deployed as a single package, then it's a monolith. What are the advantages of microservices? All right, this is a common interview question. It's not just to see if you kind of list out all those things. I would imagine somebody asking you this uh, would test your knowledge. Like, do they really understand what, what is an advantage and what is a disadvantage? So let's see, what are some advantages of microservices? Um, they have a smaller surface area per change. And I think it's critical uh, because uh, think of a monolith, right? You're building a monolith, you make a small code change. Uh, the affected surface area of that change can be pretty big, right? You wanna push the change to production, for example. What do you do? You have to deploy the whole application. You have to test this change. What do you do? You have to test the whole application, right? So any change has a big surface area in case of a, a monolith. But in the case of microservices, you have all these small, small units, and then you make a change. You're making a change to this one microservice. So you're gonna test that one microservice. You're gonna deploy that one microservice. As long as the external contract of that microservice isn't changing, you're good to go. You don't have to change the whole application. You don't have to test or deploy the whole application, all right? So that's a good thing about microservice. That's one advantage. Smaller surface area for change, for impact. Um, the other thing that it's usually faster to do this because it's a smaller surface area, it's faster to deploy changes, it's faster to test changes, faster to make changes and code them. Um, you have um, you have different technologies for these things because these are individual units which communicate via REST, which is language agnostic. You can build one microservice in, uh, in Python, you can build one microservice in Java, another microservice in JavaScript, it's all perfectly fine. So you can use the right technology for building the right thing. So usually you pick these individual microservices based on domain, business domain. So you have teams working on solving a certain problem in a business domain and building microservices for that. And those teams kind of choose what technology you need and all that stuff. It's normally not that free, like have a team choose anything, but you can have teams choose different technologies because of microservices, which is an advantage. All right, so let's see, what are some advantages? Technology diversity. Yeah, this is what I was talking about, right? You have different, you can build microservices in different technologies, which is cool. Fault isolation. A process failure should not bring the whole system down. I don't know if it's a benefit, advantage of microservices. You can build microservices which are not fault tolerant. So a single microservice can basically bring the whole system down. And you can build monoliths which are fault tolerant. So. I don't, I don't believe this. I don't think it's an advantage of microservice itself, but you can do that with both. But I guess with microservices, there are patterns which allow you to build fault tolerant microservices. Maybe that's what they're talking about. Yeah, I don't necessarily agree with this. Uh, greater support for smaller and parallel team. Um, I guess this is referring to smaller teams, you know, iterating rapidly on smaller microservices, which makes sense. Independent deployment, we covered this, independent testing, independent uh, deployment, and um, independent monitoring and all that. Deployment time reduce. I guess it is reduced if you're um, deploying individual microservices as opposed to the whole microservice. Um, Here's the thing though, if you're deploying everything from the scratch, right? Deploying a microservice, a micro, set of microservices from the scratch, deploying a monolith from the scratch, it's probably faster to deploy a monolith than to deploy like a gazillion microservices. But typically that's not what you're doing. You're deploying a small change. So that's that's why microservices wins in this, uh, in this context. All right, moving on, next question. 
What is Spring Cloud? Okay, Spring Cloud, it's like it's a, it's a bunch of um, libraries and solutions which allow you to tackle some of these cross-cutting concerns. So there are, there are all these patterns that have been developed with microservices, right? You have service discovery, which is a pattern, fault tolerance, which is a pattern, uh, configuration of microservices, there are certain patterns for it. So what, this, what Spring Cloud does is it provides all these different uh, libraries under this umbrella called the Spring Cloud, which allow you to kind of like implement those patterns on your microservice system, right? You can build uh, service discovery using the Eureka framework. You can pull in Eureka into your system and then like, yeah, you can now you have service discovery following standardized patterns, right? So Spring Cloud is kind of like a set of those, um, those libraries, those technologies, which allow you to uh, both build as well as manage your uh, microservices on the cloud. And uh, this comes with uh, it's kind of like under the Spring umbrella. Uh, you don't have to use Spring Cloud when you're working on Spring microservices, but again, you can choose to use it if you want. All right, so what is Spring Cloud? Spring Cloud is an integration software that integrates with external systems. It allows microservices framework to build applications which perform restricted amounts of data processing. What? No, 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 hang on, hang on. Wait, that is it? No, this is this is not right. That's not what Spring Cloud is, okay? So don't don't provide this answer. I guess Spring Cloud started out with the integration system. I think it was called Spring Integration or something like that. So if at all, this is an old definition, okay? This is not what Spring Cloud is. So don't answer this. Spring Cloud is again, like I said, it's a family of solutions which uh, which implement which allow you to implement standard patterns in microservices, right? So you look up a bunch of Spring Cloud solutions so that you can you can kind of tell them and say, yeah, these are the part of Spring Cloud. All right, this is a, yeah, this is a bad answer. I'm surprised. Okay, discuss uses of reports and dashboards in the environment of microservices. Reports and dashboards. I don't know if they mean um, like monitoring of microservices. You do need to monitor uh, your microservices when you have like so many of them running at the same time, right? You need to make sure they're all running fine. They're all not consuming a lot of resources. If you know, something runs out of memory, you need to know that. So you need you need a robust monitoring solution and an alerting solution so that you are, your support team knows when some instance goes down or something like that. Of course, you, you would have a system which actually spins up new instances when an instance goes down. But in spite of that, if it's still a problem, then you alert support. So there are various levels to it. I don't know if that's what they're talking about. Reports and dashboards. Maybe some kind of a managerial dashboard for people to see how, how they're doing and all that. I don't know. Uh, reports and dashboards help in monitoring and upkeep of microservices. Tons of application monitoring tools assist in this. Yeah, I guess I guess that's what they're talking about. This is an art question again. This is the top hit for microservice interview questions. Hopefully people aren't looking this up and asking questions in interviews. This is bad, this is bad stuff. Okay, what's the main differences between microservice and monolithic architecture? I'm not gonna go there, we already covered this. You basically kind of say the same things. You define microservice and you define monolith. There you go, those are your differences. All right, I'm gonna keep moving on. Um, Service startup is fast, service startup takes time. Well, again, depends on if you're doing uh, from scratch or not, we covered this. Loosely coupled architecture, tightly coupled architecture. Yeah, yeah. Changes done in a single data model does not affect other microservices. Changes done in the data model affects entire database. What? No, changes done to a microservice does not affect other microservices as long as the external contract of the microservice hasn't changed, okay? That's what this is. And it's not a, not just about the data model. Uh, microservices focuses on products, not projects. Micros Monolith puts emphasis over the whole project. Uh, I, don't, I didn't understand that. This is, uh, this is crazy stuff. So, no, I don't know what that means. Uh, maybe they're talking about the domain-driven approach of microservices. You know, I talked about that earlier, right? You, you basically have problem domains that you kind of carve out and build microservices from. Uh, Monolith puts emphasis over the whole project. I don't know what that means. Um, all right, I'm gonna move on to the next question. 
what are the challenges faced while using microservices? Well, ah, there are a lot. One is that it's it's more complex, okay? The deployment is more complex. Monitoring is more complex. Managing a product release is more complex. Uh, there are certain things which you simplify, but there are certain things which end up becoming more complex as well, okay? Uh, for example, let's say you want to build a, a system which affects multiple different teams, right? You're building a feature which affects multiple different teams. Uh, you need to make sure that you're communicating it all to those different teams properly. And uh, you need to make sure that they all deploy at the same time. So for example, I have a feature A that team, microservice team one wants to build a feature. Microservice team two is also needs to build the feature because they have to work together, right? So now you need to coordinate the deployment and make sure that, okay, after this goes, then this goes, then you release the feature. Otherwise the feature is not ready yet, right? So all the necessary microservices have to coordinate the, the feature and get that released out, okay? And typically the way this happens is using feature flags, okay? So you have a feature flag which says, okay, this feature is not ready yet. So microservice team A pushes out a feature behind a feature flag and says, okay, turn it off. And when team two is ready, then you turn this thing on. You see, it becomes a little complex. But with the monolith, that's not the case. You basically have all the changes accumulating in like a parallel branch. And then once all of them are ready, then you push it out, right? That's simple. But with microservices, it's not that simple, okay? That's first thing. Second thing, again, multiple different instances. So you need to coordinate them. You need to manage them. You need to monitor them, all right? You have more things to worry about, more things to track, more things to monitor. That's another disadvantage. So there are there are a bunch of them. Um, let's take a look at what they say. Um, microservices always rely on each other, therefore they need to communicate with each other. No, why is it a disadvantage? Well, yeah, as long as you again, as long as you have the contract right, you're fine. It's only when you change the contract that it's a problem. As it's a distributed system, it's a heavily involved model. Uh, I wouldn't put it this way, but again, I think what they're talking about is what I just mentioned, right? It's It takes a lot because there are more systems in place. So more monitoring, more tracking and all that. Uh, if you're using microservice architecture, you need to be ready for operations overhead. I think this is true. There is more operational overhead, uh, especially if you're not using the tools properly, okay? So there are, uh, tools again. Spring Cloud has a bunch of stuff which allows you to track, you know, distributed tracing and all that stuff. But if you're not using it well, yeah, your operations is going to be very, very painful. You need skilled professionals to support heterogeneously distributed microservices. I guess you need skilled professionals to build monoliths as well. I've been building monoliths for ten years. You're telling me that I'm not skilled? How dare you? I don't know. You need skill. <laughs> you need skilled professionals for e for both. Um, microservice and monolith. Okay. Um, in which cases microservice architecture best suited? Uh, microservice architecture is best suited when you have a large application with multiple teams working on it and you have a need for scaling. Okay. You need to scale up and down quickly and uh, you, there are portions of your application that needs to be scaled up or down. Okay, so now we have a large code base, a large application, and then portions need to be scaled up or down, but that's a perfect fit for microservices because you can kind of take that as a microservice and scale that up or down rather than scaling the whole thing up or down, okay? Uh, and smaller teams makes uh, rapid iteration faster because the larger the code base, the slower it is to roll out something new, okay? Because there are more things to check, more things to worry about, test, and all that. So. With microservices, you're basically kind of reducing that problem and looking at smaller units so you can iterate faster, okay? So that's a huge advantage of microservices. And the other thing is it makes going to the cloud a little easier because uh, you can deploy these microservices to the cloud. And if you have a cloud strategy, you wanna go cloud native, well, microservices is like, the, you have to use it. So those are some of the situations where microservice architecture is best suited. Uh, let's see. Microservice architecture is best suited for desktop, web, mobile devices, smart TVs, wearable, etc. I'm just going to move on. Tell me some famous companies that are using microservice architecture. 
Well, all of the big guys are using microservice architecture. Like all of the guys who need to scale, right? So, you know, uh, Facebook, Google, uh, Netflix, Twitter, uh, Uber, and uh, what else? Amazon. Like everybody uses microservice architecture these days. Uh, the there are a bunch of uh, you know industries which are still trying to catch up. Finance is trying to catch up. They're there yet because finance is usually very conservative. So banks and investment those domains they are pretty slow. Medical is pretty slow. Uh, medical is slow has been slow throughout. Um, I guess the tech industry, the tech side of things, it's, it's all microservices right now. Like everybody's, everybody's jumping into microservices. Uh, most large scale websites like Twitter, Netflix, Amazon. Yep, that's, that's fair. Uh, advanced from monolithic to microservice architecture. What are the characteristics of microservices? We covered it. I'm gonna move on. It's the same thing. Um, I'm not even gonna look at the answer. What is RESTful? RESTful is a way to build your APIs that follows the REST specification. And the REST specification involves treating an individual resource and having an endpoint that maps to a resource and then having certain verbs in terms of what you operate on that resource. So for example, you have a domain, you identify resources and say, okay, these are like, I have a user entity, Ent entity becomes a resource, right? You have uh, an account entity, account becomes a resource. And then you do operations on that resource using HTTP verbs, right? You have APIs for, for you wanna get information, you use a get API for it. You wanna update it, you use push or, uh, sorry, post or put, you know, you wanna remove it, you use delete. So there are verbs associated with it. So you have resource mapping to URLs. The action that you need to perform is the verbs, the HTTP verbs on it. And then you have ways to manage a bunch of things like, you know, how, how do you handle query parameters? How do you handle like uh, a nesting, right? You have a parent resource and a child resource, how do you handle it? So it has specifications about how the URL is formed, how the API is formed, how the interaction is. So that is what is RESTful. All right, so let's see, representations. Yeah, it stands, REST stands for representational state transfer, that's fair, it is an architectural style that helps computer systems to communicate over the internet. These web services make microservices easier to understand and implement. No, 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 this is not true. It's an architectural style, yes, that helps computer systems to communicate over the internet. Well, microservices use REST to talk to each other, but they could use anything else. It's just one of, one of, the, one of the ways to do this. Uh, these web services make microservices these web services make microservices easier to understand and implement. That's just totally wrong. Uh, no, 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 no. That's not, that's not true. Explain the three types of tests for microservices. Well, Jeff, unit test, integration test, acceptance test. You have contract testing, which is, which is kind of integration test with, with microservices. You basically look at the external contract and make sure that's tested fine. Uh, yeah, I would say those are those are the three uh, tests for microservices. Uh, uh, at the bottom level test, we can perform a general test like performance and unit tests. These tests are entirely automated. Middle level, we can perform extra exploratory tests like stress tests, usability tests. Top level, we conduct acceptance tests, which are mostly fewer in number. I guess it's kind of right, but um, I would say focus on um, unit tests, which are like you're testing the core, your methods, right? And on the unit level. And then you have the integration test, contract testing. And this is where you do like, you know, you can do performance tests and all that. And then you have uh, the acceptance tests. Some people do performance and like the cross cutting test during the acceptance test phase. You can you can kind of put it wherever you want. But if, you, if the interviewer asks you three, I would say those three, right? Unit, integration, acceptance. Uh, what are client certificates? Client certificates are, you basically, those are things that you set up for a client if you're making like a, a secure request to an endpoint, right? Microservices are basically, your services itself is a client and a server, right? You have a microservice client and a microservice server. So a client certificate is something you install on the thing that's making a request so that it has the the certificate that's necessary to make that secure request, okay? Um, yeah, I don't know. I probably wouldn't be able to answer this question well. It's a digital certificate used to make authenticated requests to a remote server. It's termed as client certificate. Yeah, that's true. It doesn't have to be authenticated though. 
it can be non-authenticated, but it is it is it has to be digitally signed. It's a secure certificate. Um, all right. Explain the use of PACT in microservice architecture. Well, PACT is um, is one of the things you can use. You remember I was talking about contract testing. It's a very important thing with microservices. You can you can change your internals of the microservices as much as you want, as long as the external API hasn't changed, right? The external contract hasn't changed. So PACT is a tool which some people use. It's not used everywhere. Uh, some people use it as a way to test that contract. There are several tools which allow you to test, uh, do contract testing for uh, your microservices. So uh, pact is like you know you, you make a pact right you have you have two people like we made a pact what is it it's an agreement so that's where, that's where the term pact comes from so it's a pact is a tool which allows you to say okay this is my microservice this is my external facing API all right this is the agreement that a client would make with me and now this tool tests your external API to make sure it hasn't broken when you when you push changes right it makes it easier for you to push changes more confidently, knowing that your API, your external API is being tested. So Pact is like, a, it's an open source tool which allows you to do it. There are several tools, it doesn't have to, you don't have to use Pact. Um, it's an open source tool which allows testing interactions between service providers and consumers. However, it is separated from the contract made. This increases the reliability of microservice applications. Yeah, the, the phrasing is very odd in these answers. I would recommend not using those understand what what the question is understand what you'd need to say and then say it in your own words that's probably going to do uh you're probably going to do a better job than what i'm seeing over here okay what's the meaning of oauth <coughs> excuse me so oauth uh is is an open protocol uh open authorization um OAuth stands for authorization. I have made a full video about this. You can check it out if you want to know. Uh, OAuth is a way for you to have uh, two systems uh, authorize against each other. You have multiple services and then they need to authorize with each other. Well, you can use OAuth as a way for them to interact with each other as opposed to a client, like a user, physical user interacting with the service. Uh, a typical example is when you use something like Facebook or something like Google uh, services in another site okay, they would need to use your Facebook credentials to log into your Facebook and you don't want to provide your Facebook credentials to them, right? So what they do is they have this arrangement called OAuth, which is an open protocol. And as long as both of them implement OAuth, they can trust each other and you having signed in to both of them can say, hey, now you guys talk to each other and play nice, okay? So that is OAuth. And this is useful in a microservice context because guess what? In microservices, you have one user and you have all these different services, right? They are talking to each other. You want them to trust each other. And OAuth is a way for you to get those services to trust each other so that each service doesn't come to you and say, hey, log in, hey, log in, hey, log in, right? You don't, doesn't, you don't wanna do that. So the OAuth is a way for you to have that, that authorization kind of like understood among all the different uh, microservices in your system. Uh, OAuth means Open Authorization Protocol. Protocol allows you to access client applications on HTTP for third-party providers, GitHub, Facebook, etc. It allows you to share resources stored on one site with another site without the need for the credentials. That's fair, that's fair. Um, what is end-to-end -end microservice testing? This is where you, you want to do the complete thing, right? I talked about contract testing where you take a, a microservice in isolation. Contract testing is basically like unit testing where the microservice is a unit, but end-to-end -end microservice testing is where you basically deploy the whole thing and you test the whole thing, okay? So it's um, you're pretending to be the user and you're automating those API calls and making sure you're getting the right response. And an end-to-end -end microservice testing involves making a request to like the gateway and the gateway sending requests to a bunch of different microservices, all of them working together to give you the response. And then you get the response and then you validate it, right? You're not testing one microservice alone, you're testing the system. All right, uh, end-to-end validates every process in the workflow is functioning correctly and ensures that the system works together as a whole and satisfies all requirements. Okay, okay. Why are container used in microservices? Containers are used in microservices, like for example, Docker. It's used in microservices because uh, deployment 
is uh, is fairly common, right? You need to deploy a lot in microservices. You take one service, you need to deploy it into 10 machines, 20 machines, you need to scale up and down and all that. And every microservice has certain uh, requirements, right? You might have a microservice which say, okay, I need this particular software to be installed. I want this con configuration to be in this particular way. I want the setting to be in this particular way. So when you have all those needs, it becomes hard for you to scale up your deployment into various different machines because you're gonna have to do all of those steps for every time you deploy a microservice. However, if you were to use a container technology like Docker, you kind of bake it into your Docker image. So in every case, when you wanna deploy a microservice to a fresh like EC2 instance, you just deploy a Docker image and everything that's necessary for that microservice comes with it, all right? So that makes it easier. Um, all right. What is the meaning of semantic monitoring in microservice architecture? So semantic monitoring is when you're, uh, I think it's testing. You're, you're testing business cases, which is what this means. So for example, you're, you're building like an e-commerce application using microservices. Uh, one way to test your microservices is by taking a microservice and then testing it in isolation. Okay, like the contract testing, right? The other is end-to-end -end testing, which is basically testing everything. But semantic monitoring, what you're doing is you're monitoring a certain use case, a certain flow, a business flow, and making sure that that's working fine. So for example, your e-commerce site, you need to make sure checkout works fine, okay? So checkout might be one microservice, it might be like two or three different microservices, okay? So you're taking that one business flow, which is critical, if you're Amazon, you wanna make sure people can buy your stuff, right? Checkout process is critical. So you have test cases which test just the checkout process, right? From adding something to a card to checking it out. So you're looking at a business use case as opposed to either a microservice or the whole application and testing those business use cases alone, all right? So that's uh, that's called semantic. Semantic is basically meaning, meaning-based, all right? So here, whatever has a business meaning, you basically take that out and then you test that. That is semantic monitoring. Let's see. Semantic monitoring combines automated tests with monitoring of the application. It allows you to find out reasons why your business is not getting more profits. I'll tell you why your business is not getting more profits because your interviewers ask these questions and hire people who gave these answers. That's why your business is not making profits. This is a really stupid answer. Um, you understood what semantic monitoring is, right? It's basically monitoring individual flows, making sure that's tested and that's working fine all the time. Okay, that's semantic monitoring. Whew. What is CDC? CDC is contract driven, uh, client driven contracts, all right? So this is basically the idea of uh, having a client specify what the contract is for a microservice and then defining it from there as opposed to you just coming up with a contract out of thin air, all right? So it's about being aware of who the client is, what they want all the time, what are the changes that they would need to make, and what you need to make in order to support the, the client's requirements. Okay, so it's client, uh, consumer-driven contract is another way. I don't know if it's client-driven or consumer-driven. It's a pattern for developing microservices so that external systems can use them. I don't know. It's basically focusing on the client first, okay? Starting with the client and have the client drive the contract have them come up with like talking to other teams, having them say, okay, what is it that you really need? And then building your API, building your contract from that is what CDC is, right? Customer driven contract or client driven contract. What's the use of Docker? Uh, we talked about this, it's container containerization, right? You use Docker to have an image of a microservice that you can safely deploy on a fresh virtual machine so that you know that your microservice has everything it needs to work, okay? It allows you to scale up your deployments by codifying what a microservice needs in terms of an image, okay? This includes other software that it needs, configuration that it needs, all its set settings and all that stuff. So that's, that's why you would use Docker with microservices. Every time I'm scrolling down, I'm preparing mentally for a really stupid answer. I don't mean to be so rude and, uh, you know, to these guys, guru99.com, but I don't know, if somebody answers these, this way, I would be like, what are you even talking about? Uh, let's see how they do this. Uh, Docker offers container environment which can be used to host any application. This software application dependencies that support it are tightly packaged together. I guess this is a fair answer. I'll give them this. This is, like if you answer this, this is fine. But basically that's the idea, right? You're packaging your, your uh, 
microservices exactly the way you want them deployed. So you don't have to bother about configuring them every time you just deploy the Docker image. All right, so some answers are right. Some answers are very, very weird, right? So be careful. What are reactive extensions in microservices? Reactive extensions are not related to microservices. Reactive extensions are a way for you to write asynchronous code using reactive patterns, right? Using the observable pattern. Uh, basically, you, you can use reactive extensions anywhere, right? For event-driven applications, you can use reactive extensions, um, which is basically writing asynchronous code, right? It's a, it's a pattern for writing, writing asynchronous code using the reactive model of streams and observables and uh, kind of like chaining those. In the, there's a little bit of functional programming that's involved as well. Uh, and uh, well, that's actually why reactive extensions became popular in Java with lambdas and all that it became easier to, to do that kind, of, that kind of programming in Java. So it has nothing to do with, um, with microservices. I guess you can use reactive extensions when you're building microservices if you're building asynchronous services, right? Asynchron if you're writing asynchronous code, in your microservices, you would use uh, reactive extensions. Reactive extensions is also called Rx. It's a design pattern which allows collecting results by calling multiple services and then compile a combined response. Rx is a popular tool in distributed systems which work exactly opposite to legacy flows. This is not what reactive extensions are, okay? Design pattern to collect multiple results by calling multiple services and combining them to a response, which is what you would do in microservices, okay? So you would typically, it's common for a microservice to call other microservices, get the data, kind of combine them together and send it back. It's got nothing to do with Rx, okay? Rx is a popular tool in distributed systems which work exactly opposite to legacy flows. No, don't say this, okay? That's not the right answer. Explain the term continuous monitoring. Continuous monitoring is a way for you to constantly check how your microservices are doing. It's an addition to the C terms, okay? So there is a CI, CD, con continuous integration, continuous delivery. So there is continuous monitoring as well. So if you're constantly releasing stuff by using CI, CD, you need to constantly monitor it as well, right? So because you can introduce a bug at any point of time, okay? So continuous monitoring is a way for you to kind of constantly keep, keep a check on the health of your system. This includes kind of implementing some kind of a distributed tracing mechanism to make sure that if there is an error, you know how to check it. If this involves checking how your systems are doing, like what's the processor utilization, memory utilization, when do you need to scale up, when do you need to scale down, you know, number of requests that are coming, there's something called QPS. Uh, all those things are, you know, you have to constantly check. You have dashboards for checking that, which is what the, the earlier question was, right? What are the dashboards you would use? So that's continuous monitoring. Constantly checking your microservice system to make sure everything is good. Uh, continuous monitoring is a method of use for checking, searching compliance and risk issues associated with companies' operational and financial environment. Contain human processes, working system which support efficient and actual operations. Again, no, 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 no. This is not right, right? Don't say this. How independent microservices communicate with each other? They use REST APIs. Well, they can technically use any APIs, but a common common choice is use REST APIs, and then the, the payload is a JSON payload. The content type is JSON. Depends on the project needs. However, in most cases, developers use HTTP REST with JSON or binary. They can use any communication protocol. Good answer, right? This one's a good answer. It's all over the place, this thing. Okay, I think we're done. So these were 24 questions. They lied. I think, say, 25 questions and they lied and there's one question short. But these are supposedly the top 25 slash 24 microservice interview questions and answers. I'm amazed that this is the top um, ranked search for microservice interview questions. Do you guys see this as a top hit for your searches? It's uh, the answers are all over the place. So hopefully my answers were helpful. Don't say these answers as is mentioned over here. Some of these answers are clearly wrong and you shouldn't be mentioning this. Of course, you stand the risk of an interviewer looking at these and expecting the same answers. 
uh, if they expect the same answer, then you don't want to work in that company anyway, because that's, um, yeah, that's not good. So these were the top microservice interview questions and answers. Uh, I have, I'm going to link to the Brain Bytes playlist, which has some of these concepts explained in more detail. So go check that out.